The Bible says my king is the king of the Jews. He's the king of Israel. He's the king of righteousness. He's the king of the ages. He's the king of heaven. He's the king of glory. He's the king of kings. And he's the Lord of lords. That's my king. I wonder, do you know him? My king is a sovereign king. No means of measure can define his limitless love. He's enduringly strong. He's entirely sincere. He's eternally steadfast. He's immortally graceful. He's imperially powerful. He's impartially merciful. Do you know him? He's the greatest phenomenon that has ever crossed the horizon of this world. He's God's son. He's a sinner's savior. He's the centerpiece of civilization. He's unparalleled. He's unprecedented. He is the loftiest idea in literature. He's the highest personality in philosophy. He's the fundamental doctrine of true theology. He's the only one qualified to be an all-sufficient savior. I wonder if you know him today. He supplies strength for the weak. He's available for the tempted and the tried. He sympathizes and he saves. He strengthens and sustains. He guards and he guides. He heals the sick. He cleans the lepers. He forgives sinners. He discharges debtors. He delivers the captive. He defends the feeble. He blesses the young. He serves the unfortunate. He regards the age. He rewards the diligent. And he beautifies the meek. I wonder if you know him. He's the key to knowledge. He's the wellspring of wisdom. He's the doorway of deliverance. He's the pathway of peace. He's the roadway of righteousness. He's the highway of holiness. He's the gateway of glory. Do you know him? Well, his life is matchless. His goodness is limitless. His mercy is everlasting. His love never changes. His word is enough. His grace is sufficient. His reign is righteous. And his yoke is easy. And his burden is light. Uh, I wish I could describe him to you. Yes, he's indescribable. He's incomprehensible. He's invincible. He's irresistible. You can't get him out of your mind. You can't, you can't get him off of your hand. You can't outlive him and you can't live without him. Well, the Pharisees couldn't stand him, but they found out they couldn't stop him. Pilate couldn't find any fault in him. Herod couldn't kill him. Death couldn't handle him. And the grave couldn't hold him. Yeah! That's my king. That's my king. Amen. Maybe someday I'll grow to the point where I could preach a sermon like Pastor Lockridge there. That's a, that's a classic. But I am supposed to say that the VBS meeting is at 6.30 p.m. <clears throat> so as we gather together, um, we used to, before COVID, have a time where we'd have a time for offering. And we don't do that anymore. So uh, churches did that, not have offerings before COVID, but then they would spend so much time talking about the offering that they don't take up um, instead of passing the offering plate that it was like the same thing. So if you came as an act of worship, if you'd like to give, there's a box there. You can give online at rockwell.church forward slash give. Online giving is a great way to honor the Lord with your finances and help support the church. So um, when it comes to Resurrection Sunday or Easter, there are lots of opportunities for people to debate things, lots of opportunities for people to even fight and divide over things. For instance, some people won't come to a church if they invite you to Easter because they say it's Resurrection Sunday. But if you're trying to reach your culture, the people out there that might not come to church, they like, what, what Sunday? Resurrection? So culturally, we call it Easter. So we promote it as Easter. And if you were here on Good Friday, I mentioned that... Um, 
Jesus having Good Friday, remembering Jesus' death on Friday, um, and then for him to rise again on Sunday, isn't like 100% uh, you know, said in stone, the Bible definitely says that Jesus was crucified on Friday and he rose again on Sunday morning. So um, Bible scholars can show you great charts and everything, but some say it was Wednesday, some say it was Thursday. And I threw that out there in my Good Friday message. And my point was, it's not a topic or a subject that you need to argue because it doesn't matter. So what matters is that he rose on the third day. And we believe that. So when that day started, um, so if somebody wants to get in an argument about faith and discredit Christ, you don't even have to go there to try to describe that. We need to keep the main issues the main issues and not get caught up in all these little side issues that cause us great distraction. So I love Resurrection Sunday because it is the time that we celebrate not only what Jesus did, but what we get as a result of it. So because Jesus overcame death and was resurrected from the grave, we as his followers can be assured that that will happen for us. That when Jesus said that he has gone to prepare a place for us, when Jesus said that... um, As we follow him, that he will care for us. Uh, We can trust that. So in Luke 24, this isn't on the screen, but after he talked, he was like bailed. Or um, the guys, the guys on the road to Emmaus didn't really know it was Jesus as they were carrying out this conversation, saying, "Didn't you hear about Jesus and whatever?" Didn't really know it was him until Jesus revealed that. And then uh, Jesus goes to the disciples, Luke 24, 38, and he said, "Why are you troubled?" And why do doubts rise in your minds? Look at my hands and my feet. It is I myself. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. And verse 44 says, This is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets and the Psalms. And then he opened their minds so that they could understand the scriptures. He told them, this is what is written, the Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day and repentance for forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. And then he promised the Holy Spirit would come and help with that. And Paul, in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 13, Paul says, if there's no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. And we're false witnesses if we're preaching that, if if Christ hadn't been raised from the dead, but he has been. And because he lives, like the song we just sung, Because he lives, I have seven points that I wanted to share with you about why that matters to us today, why that is such a big deal for us in our Christ life today. It's really important for us as Christ followers to not get just so tied up in religious ritual and just go through the motions without thinking about what other people are thinking about faith, thinking about how this faith in Christ really matters to us. Because if in this, you know, in the coming culture, it's already here, this post-Christian nation, uh, if you talk to Canadian pastors that have been in a post-Christian country for a while, uh, there's lots of people that are just pushing church out of the way, saying, you know, well, that my grandparents did that, but that's not for me. I don't believe in that or whatever. But we're going to have to step out in faith and take a risk and proclaim what we believe in Christ and be able to back it up. We don't have to give an intense defense for everything, but we should be able to stand for Christ and stand with others who stand for Christ. So if somebody goes to work and they are mocked for their faith and they don't have any Christian friends or they go to school or whatever, wouldn't it be great if they could come to church and find that kind of encouragement, that fellowship, that camaraderie, those other people that are standing for Christ, believing in Christ. And so when we know whom we have believed, when we know how valuable faith is, when we know that not only is Jesus the solution to our sin problem and our fire insurance to make sure that we don't go to hell but we go to heaven, but that we can have a personal relationship with Christ, that we can have the power of Christ in us, that we can make a difference in this world, in this neighborhood, uh, in someone's life near us, that is very exciting. So I'm going to look at Hebrews chapter 10, 
And so most of it is going to follow along in these How to Find God New Testaments, the New Living Translation. I mentioned before that I would love if you all had at least one, uh, like in a plastic bag or something in your car or, or with you, so that you could give it to someone. Because in the front pages here, it says our problem with sin and how we're separated from God and how we can be made right with God. And then it talks about how to live the Christian life. And so it is like a Swiss army knife of discipleship. It is a tool that can make a difference you'll find that there are many different Bible translations out there and that as churches are bringing Bibles like this to a culture that doesn't know much about the gospel, doesn't know much about church, doesn't know much about religious things or religious words, that the New Living Translation is making a difference. Matter of fact, if you wanted to talk to me, I could start to name off a list of all the fast-growing churches in the Twin Cities that are using the New Living Translation and why Chuck Swindoll has chosen it. So we're not changing Bible translations, but we're using it for evangelism. And there's so much more in this Bible than we would have with just a gospel tract gospel tracts are good, your personal testimony is good, it is all good, but here today, most of the message using the New Living Translation. So in Hebrews 10, verse 11, um, you have to remember that Hebrews is written to a group of people, some Christ followers who are about to turn their back on the whole thing. So they were uh, just going to go back to Judaism in the old way because it was just too hard. It was too difficult. There was lots of understand, misunderstandings. There was lots of uh, conflicts. And the same thing is true in our world today. Uh, you know, people say that we shouldn't talk about politics and we shouldn't talk about religion if we all want to get along. But I think that's probably Satan's lie. Uh, Satan doesn't want you to talk to anybody about your faith in Christ because he would hate to see them become a child of God, be born again, and follow Jesus instead of him. But under the old covenant, the priest stands and ministers before the altar day after day, offering the same sacrifices again and again, which can never take away sin. So in the Old Testament, the priest would stand there and he would keep giving offerings. He would keep making sacrifices it was actually a weird economy, too, because the priest was able to keep some of that. So basically, the more the people sinned, the better off the priest and his family were. That's just kind of a weird thing, if you think about it. But so they stood there, and they kept offering these sacrifices over and over again, and it just never ended. So uh, the sacrifice they offered wasn't enough to take care of people since it was what God wanted. It was the right thing to do. It was the prescription for the time, but there had to be a better way. Verse 12, but our high priest, Jesus, offered himself to God as a single sacrifice for sins, good for all time. And then he sat down in the place of honor at God's right hand. Did you see that? So Jesus the high priest, offered himself as the sacrifice. And did he stand there day after day and keep doing it again? No, because it was the perfect sacrifice and it was done. So therefore, he didn't need to stand there anymore. He could sit down at the right hand of God. There he waits, verse 13, until his enemies are humbled and made a footstool under his feet. What is he waiting for? What is he waiting for? He is waiting for that perfect time when he returns and sets things right. But until then, he is waiting for the church. He is waiting on the church to share Jesus with other people so that more people can be saved, so that our children and our grandchildren and maybe the unborn people that we don't even know yet will have an opportunity to be saved and spend eternity with us in heaven. So the longer Jesus waits, the more opportunities there are for people to come to Christ. Some people hear the message and they don't respond right away. Sometimes people need to go through a hard time, a job loss, a sickness, some kind of hard thing before they get serious about following God when they realize their life is a mess and then they come to Christ. Other people, um, they hear the message, they respond right away and they get serious about following Jesus and living for him. Other people uh, say a prayer and they mean it and they want to follow Jesus, but they don't do much with it after that. They don't uh, spend any time looking into Scripture. They don't spend any time trying to grow in their faith. Uh, it's just kind of a side thing for them, and maybe they show up at Christmas and Easter. So, but Jesus made it possible. He waits until his enemies are humbled and made a footstool for that by that one offering, he forever made perfect those who are being made holy. Those who are being made holy 
Are you one of those people who are being made holy? If we, say, had a Sunday night service or something like that, and it was just a night of testimonies, and just people just got up to the microphone and shared what their life was like before they came to Christ, how they came to Christ, and what their life has been like since, would you be able to look back and see how not only did Jesus save you, but He sanctified you, and He's changing you, and you're becoming more and more like Him? You're growing in this process. You're learning more about the Lord. You're Learning more about how to share your faith, how to serve, how to make a difference, how to encourage each other, all of those different things. If you're one of those holy people that the Lord is making perfect, church is a great place for you to be, to encourage each other, to build each other up, to serve together. And then out of that, I have these seven things. So uh, don't get distracted by having to fill out the blanks if you don't want. So at uh, 1120, uh, the answers to the notes are all going to pop up online on our website at rockwell.church. So, and also the video of this if you wanted to share this. But number one, number one, because he lives, we can be forgiven of our sins because of Jesus' sacrifice. We can be forgiven. So the Old Testament sacrifices, uh, like I said, they didn't take care of everything the way Jesus sacrificed did. And it's worth celebrating. So uh, when you think about sin, sin is actually doing anything that dishonors God, displeases God. You know, sometimes we just think that sin is, you know, some of the big things, not like breaking the Ten Commandments. So actually, so next week we're going to start a series on the Ten Commandments, and we don't keep the Ten Commandments to be right with God, but we should keep the Ten Commandments because we are right with God. And so um, nine of the Ten Commandments are like totally reaffirmed in the New Testament, and then the keeping the Sabbath uh, is kind of uh, clarified what that means. We should still spend time with God. But, so we're going to talk about that in the next series. But, but think about the th- sins that you struggle with, the sins of the past, the th- sins that you um, have done in your life, and that we can be forgiven of that. So what's even better about when Jesus forgives the sin is that after it's forgiven, we don't have to keep praying over and over again for him to forgive those same sins. We might struggle with sins from day to day. Um, Jesus died for those too, uh, but we should confess those. Uh, First John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and uh, cleanse us from all unrighteousness when we confess our sins. So we stay in a right relationship with God, but because he lives, it opens the door for forgiveness. And that makes such a huge difference. Some people, they don't think that they need to be forgiven or they don't come to Christ because of pride, because they don't realize the severity of their sin, because they don't realize how holy God is, um, because they think that God is not approachable, that he doesn't care, that he's not interested in the things that go on in our life from day to day. Or maybe there's been some kind of disappointment. Uh, Maybe it's something that we did that led to... um, well, some kind of penalty, some kind of discipline from God for our sins, and that was disheartening. Um, so we struggle with that, or sometimes other people do things, and we wonder why God couldn't, couldn't fix that, and we go through these different things. But we need, in humility, in faith, to ask forgiveness of our sins, to come to faith in Christ, and then how to find God in the New Testament, right in the very beginning, uh, makes it clear on how you can do that. Number one, recognize and confess that you are a sinner. Number two, recognize that Jesus died on the cross for you. Number three, repent of your sin. Number four, receive Christ into your life. And then there's even a recommended uh, prayer. Um, But it gives you all the details. And then after that, it talks about how to live the Christian life. People need to be forgiven. People need to see how they can be forgiven. They need forgiven people to come to them and tell them how that works so that they can experience forgiveness too. We can be forgiven. Verse 16, this is the new covenant I will make with my people on that day, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their hearts and I will write them on their minds. And then he said, I will never again remember their sins and lawless deeds. And when sins have been forgiven, there is no need to offer any more sacrifices. We're all going to struggle, if we're serious about following Christ, we're all going to struggle with sin until the time that we leave this earth, until either Jesus returns or we die, or we're 
going to struggle with different types of sin. And I'm going to tell you a story in a little bit that Matt Chandler told in a book, but he is the pastor of a church who is on Right Now Media. Uh, you can get free Right Now Media stuff at, right, at rockwell.church forward slash right now. But anyway, so he got in trouble for texting uh, some woman that wasn't his wife, some things that were seen as inappropriate, and his elders took him aside, and they're like, dude, you crossed the line, we need to talk about this. So, and they ordered that he get some retraining, and then he get his head examined. And they're like, why would, you, why would he get his head examined? Well, because he re- recently recovered from brain cancer, and they wanted to make sure if every, everything was okay. So he followed the plan, um, and they recently restored him to pastoral ministry after that. And he is glad that the elders of his church were watching over him, keeping those standards. But here we have this holy guy who does really great with books and videos and everything else who just stumbled and crossed the line. And so nobody knows exactly, you know, if it was even that bad. But, uh, and, you know, compared to some issues, it probably wasn't, you know, that bad at all. But he was willing to humble himself. And the reason that I'm bringing this up is because every one of us str- struggle. Every one of us will disappoint. Every one of us struggle with some kind of sin. And so when we're forgiven, we move on from that. And we keep moving forward with the Lord, who is the one that can take care of our sins. And not only does he take care of our sins, not only does he clean that slate or, uh, you know, wash up that mess, or I like to think about, uh, you know, cleaning the pipe. So if I want a steady flow of God's blessing and love coming in my life, I want to keep my pipes clean. So I've experienced plumbing pipes that have gotten corroded with gunk and everything, and they get clogged up. And I think that sin is like the hair and the gunk that clogs up the pipe. And when Jesus, when we confess that sin and Jesus cleanses that, that, that sin, that mess, then it flows freely. But he offers forgiveness, and then it invites us. We are invited to boldly come into God's presence by the blood of Jesus. We are invited to boldly come into God's presence. So, Before, we were distant from God, didn't know if He cared about us, and now we have a personal invitation. A personal invitation, so dear brothers and sisters, we can boldly enter heaven's most holy place because of the blood of Jesus. By His death, Jesus opened a new and life-giving way through the curtain into the most holy place. What, what What is He talking about? So in Mark 15... Uh, When Jesus is on the cross at noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. And at three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, Leba, Lema, Sek, I could say this before, Sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing near heard this, they say, listen, he's calling for Elijah. And someone ran, filled the sponge with wine vinegar, put it on a staff and offered it to Jesus to drink. Now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes and takes him down. Then, with a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last, and the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion who stood there in front of Jesus saw how he died, he said, surely this man is the Son of God. So that curtain, I I mentioned this uh, during the Good Friday service. One of the problems of you're a pastor and you're preparing two messages at the same time, one on Friday and one on Sunday, is sometimes they overlap and they they kind of they kind of bleed together. I talked about some of this already, but that curtain separated the priests from the holy of holies from the uh, in the tabernacle in the temple, and so it was ripped from the top down. God ripped it in two. God opened it up. God said, "No more of this." separation. No more of this. Me staying away from you, you staying away from me. He opened it wide open. We do not need a priest to come uh, reconcile us, a priest to stand in the gap, to be the middleman. Uh, Jesus is our high priest, and we can have direct access to God. Do we take that direct access to God? Do we boldly approach His throne? Do we come to Jesus And in our time of need, do we look at him as the one who is, like the thing that we watched from 
uh, Pastor Lockridge, uh, do we come to him in full assurance of who he is and what he thinks about us and how he loves us? So Jesus says, I'm the gate and whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. He will guide and protect and provide and keep us safe as we follow Jesus. And Jesus in John 14, 6 says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. If we're safe and secure in Jesus, do we pursue that? Do we, do we come into his presence in our time of need? Do we pray when we're, even when we messed up, do we pray that God would help us? Do we pray things like, Lord, please help me pass this exam. Lord, help me find a job. Uh, I prayed for specific things that were amazing. I've told this story before, I'm not going to tell it, but I prayed for a wife. And she showed up at my parents' door and bought their car. I was in a different state, but I heard about her. And I took her out to dinner a month later. And we've been married for over 35 years. That was an answer to prayer. We prayed that we could adopt a child. I prayed many times before that God would help me to pay my bills. uh, That God would help me make a friend. That God would help me stop eating apple fritters. So... I feel bad, too, because when I gave up the apple fritter habit, it was about the same time our local town bakery closed forever. It was sad. And I did have friends. I do have friends. And I had a friend that was such a friend that he wasn't a friend that when he heard that I was trying to give up apple fritters, he came to my door on a Saturday, knocked on the door, dropped off a fresh apple fritter. I'm like, what are you doing? So... And I gave into that temptation as a form of hospitality. But anyway, <laughs> number three, we have a personal relationship with Jesus leading us as our high priest in heaven. Leading us as our high priest in heaven. He knows our hearts. He knows our condition. He knows our future. He knows the things that we're going to do. He knows the things that we could do if we had enough faith. The things that we could do if we'd step up to the opportunity. There are so many people that just feel they're unworthy that say, I could never do that. So they won't take a chance. They won't step up. They won't serve in ministry because they don't want to take a risk. But the faithful people that just show up and humbly say, Lord, I don't know if I can do this, but I'm willing. Please help me are the ones that God seems to use, are the ones that God seems to make a difference in people's lives, are the ones that sometimes become the future leaders of our church. But we have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Verse 21, since we have a great high priest who rules over God's house, who rules over God's house. So God's house is heaven. God's house is the kingdom that he is building here through the church. God's house is the house of faith among believers. God's house is where people of God dwell in fellowship, and Jesus Christ leads us along. Have you ever come to a point in your Christian life, I'm assuming that you've received Jesus as your Lord and Savior and you're saved, but have you ever come to a point where you wanted to go a step further, where you wanted just more of the Lord and you prayed something like, Jesus, I understand that you died for my sin and that you forgave me and that I have this relationship with you and the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit, but would you lead me to do more? I'm willing to do whatever it is that you want me to do and go wherever it is that you want me to go. I want to follow you and see where that leads and be willing to make changes if it leads to something else. So my wife and I have been following Jesus for quite a long time, and it's led to some pretty interesting places. So it's led to surprising places. It led me to the Iron Range. It led me away from the Iron Range. And to our great surprise, it led us back to the Iron Range. So it's a mystery, the things that will go on in our life. But we trust as Jesus leads us because Jesus wants to pull us up, but the world wants to pull us down. If you listen to the world's advice, they want to lead you astray. They want to pull you into sin. The more you sin, the better they feel about their sin. Sometimes they want to lure you into spending money. Sometimes they want to lure you into addiction. Sometimes they want to lure you away from making a difference for God. But Jesus wants to pull you up. He wants to pull you up into a holy life, to a meaningful life, a purposeful life. So that you can come to the end of your days like our friend Bob Anderson when he was in the nursing home. He wasn't doing really well, and I was talking to him, and he's like, he smiles, and he said, the Lord has been good to me. The Lord has been good to me all these days of my life. I praise the Lord. 
I want to look back on my life, even though it's hard, even though it's difficult, even though yesterday was the birthday of our son who died, and wonder why God would allow that. But to come to the end of my days and say, God, I haven't always been faithful, but you have been faithful, even my unfaithfulness. I praise you. I lift you up. Number four, we are cleansed from our sinful past. We are cleansed from our sinful past, and that means that we need to let it go. So it wouldn't do any good for me to be up here and to share how sinful my past was and then have you try to outdo it. That's not good for edification. That's not really good for anything. So a lot of people have a sinful past they don't talk about. Uh, There might be a time when God wants you to bring it up and other times where it's best not said. Uh, In a second here, I'll show you how Matt Chandler shared his but we're cleansed from a sinful past. Matter of fact, I'll do it right now. So Matt Chandler is a Christian leader uh, that is um, on our Right Now Media service, and he tells the following story in one of his books about what happened after speaking at a conference near his hometown. When I was done preaching, I decided to hop in my car, drive 20 minutes to the town in which I grew up, and look at the houses that I remembered from back then. As I drove into town, I passed a field where I once got into a fist fight with a kid named Sean. It was not a fair fight, and I did some shady, dark things in that fight. I completely humiliated him in front of a large crowd of people. Then I drove past my first house, and I thought about all the wicked things I had done in that house. I passed a friend's house where once at a party, I did some of the most shameful, horrific things that I have ever done. Afterward, on the drive back to the conference, I was overwhelmed with the guilt and shame of the wickedness of what I had done in that city prior to knowing Christ. I could hear the whisper in my heart, you call yourself a man of God? Are you going to stand in front of these guys and tell them to be men of God after all that you have done? In the middle of that guilt and shame, I began to be reminded by the scriptures that the old Matt Chandler is dead. The Matt Chandler who did those things, the Matt Chandler who sinned in those ways, was nailed to that cross with Christ Jesus, and all of his sins, past, present, and future, were paid for in full on the cross of Jesus Christ. I have been sanctified once for all. He remembers my sins no more, and I no longer need to feel shame for those things because those things have been completely atoned for. That's in his book, The Explicit Gospel. So we look through the past and we remember the sins and verse 22 says, let us go right into the presence of God with sincere hearts, fully trusting him for our guilty consciences have been sprinkled with Christ's blood to make us clean and our bodies have been washed with pure water. So we approach God's throne with reverence and thankfulness. We approach God's throne with expectation and resolve and humility and sincere hearts. Number five, we are given true hope to hold on to. We need hope, and hope is a great thing in our lives. Let us hold tightly without wavering to the hope we affirm, for God can be trusted to keep his promise. And we trust, we have hope, we know how the story ends, we know that Jesus is victorious, we know that we can be conquerors as we trust in our faith in Christ, as as we walk in Christ. And so, things can change so fast. I mean, our life can be dark and dreary and surrounded by sin, and then all of a sudden things can just rapidly change, almost like the weather, where last Wednesday we canceled because it was too icy and too snowy, and this Wednesday, according to the forecast that now says something about being 78 degrees, we might have a hard time getting kids to come inside the door because it's so nice out, and things can change that fast. So, number six, we are motivated to lovingly serve one another. Motivated to lovingly serve one another. Let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. So, how can we motivate and encourage each other? Maybe you came to church today and maybe God would bring you here to hear this message. Maybe through your devotions, maybe you could come up with a better message than I had for today. Maybe God brought you here to encourage someone. Maybe you're supposed to talk to someone to encourage them. Maybe you're supposed to invite them out to lunch. Maybe you're supposed to say, hey, I've been a believer in Christ for a while. Maybe we'd like together and get together and have our own little Bible study, discipleship time or, or whatever. What can we do to encourage each other? What can we do to build each other up? What can we do to care for each other? Thinking of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. And Jerry, you can come on up here. Number seven, my last point. We gather with Christ followers to live well 
lives together. There's so many things we could do as a church. The more resources we have, the more things we can do. The primary things we do is we gather together to worship God, to build each other up in our faith, to win lost people to Christ, to help train up people for ministry, to hopefully multiply ministries in the church, and maybe even send out people to be missionaries or into other churches or whatever, to be a training ground. So many things we can do. And we're celebrating one year of being called Rock. Rockwell Church, connecting people to Christ the Rock, connecting people of all ages to Christ the Rock, so together we could live well lives of worshiping, encouraging, learning, and loving. And if we focus on those kinds of things, we're going to grow in the church, and the Lord's going to grow the church, and the church is going to make a difference, a bigger impact, a bigger difference in the community and all around. And there's so many things that we can do to use our skills together. Let us not neglect our meeting together, as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of the Lord's return is drawing near. So maybe you came today and you had never received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Um, If you're a sinner in need of salvation, you could pray something like it's in the front of the New Believers, How to Find God in New Testament. But Lord Jesus, I am a sinner. I acknowledge that I've sinned against you and done wrong. Please forgive me of my sin and come into my life and save me and make me the person you created me to be. I want to follow you and learn of you. Lord, thank you for saving me in Jesus' name. Amen. If you've received Christ as your Lord and Savior, let us know that next time we get together, we're going to look at living the Ten Commandments for a blessed life. And Jerry has a special song for us now.